Behind me is the Jock Safari Lodge in a small private concession in the Kruger National Park, and normally it would be teeming with tourists. But it's a slightly different audience this weekend. People from around the world who've gathered for Kevin Peterson's Legacy Experience. It's a conservation fundraiser that doesn't just put money into the fight against poaching, but also brings together some very influential people to talk about the challenge that conservation is facing in South Africa. And the highlight of this weekend, I'll be jumping in a helicopter and together with a world-class vet and pilot and the head ranger at the Kruger, going to dart a rhino and take off some of that horn in the hope that it helps to save these magnificent beasts. something I've never done before. We're about to take off. We are with Africa's top ranger, we're with Africa's top vet, Africa's top pilot, and a guy who played some cricket. And we're off to go and find a rhino and effectively save its life. So that took just a few minutes from an extraordinary dart that hit its target straight away and then this uh, this poor rhino looked like he'd had a couple too many and then uh, tumbled down. First time I've seen this, Kevin, you've seen it many times, but every time it's extraordinary, isn't it? It's extraordinary. It's, it's actually... <laughs> I mean, I don't like it. I, I, I find it incredibly sad, and I don't like to see the situation that the animal's in at the moment. Uh, and that's why I'm not a massive, a massive one for this, but knowing what it actually does for the animal and what it does for the entire uh, species, uh, it's one of those last resorts that we're having to resort to now, is to dehorn and take as much of the horn um, off them as possible. So it started by microchipping, and all the experiences I've had uh, previous experiences were around uh, microchipping and uh, but now it's all about dehorning taking as much of the horn off as possible so that they're not targets for um, for the poachers and uh, I mean it is it's so sad to see this but it's so necessary and the fact that there's not a huge amount of horn on this poor beast but yet we need to take what's left off just to keep it safe uh, it's such a valu valuable commodity uh, it's the most valuable commodity on the black market so when you see how much more horn there is there got to get rid of it because I mean that there is worth tens of thousands of dollars. It's a sad situation but this is the best being made of it. Uh, before he jumps up and starts chasing me and Kevin across the Kruger and I know he'll win that race at the moment, uh, let's get rid of the rest of the horn that's there now. So this was my dream job. This was becoming a rhino proctologist. Unfortunately, the crutches mean I can't. And so my good friend Derek McCaskill, who's in familiar territory here, is taking the stool <laughs> sample instead. And I'll tell you what, if I was a rhino, I'm not sure Derek would be top of my list on people doing this job. So the horn is off, and this, this is what these creatures are being butchered and massacred for. And, and when you know what's actually in here, this is zero medicinal value. This is, this is basically just fingernails, it Kevin. Is keratin, uh, Dan. That's all this is. It is your fingernail, and it has absolutely no medicinal value whatsoever. What you see here is exactly what you've got on your fingers and your fingers fingertips. So to see what we're having to do here to protect a species, and that's what we're doing actually, we're trying to save this animal's life. Taking off the horn, taking away its value, that's what we're doing. Um, but it's incredibly sad, so it is great work, but it's sad work too. But I mean, this is it. It's keratin, it's fingernail, um, but it's a vital job that uh, a lot of amazing people are doing. And you, you know how much value there is and you understand the economics of it. But when you sit next to one of these beasts and you just can't get your head around the fact that the people go out and kill these guys just yeah. for something so utterly meaningless. Yeah.
Kathy, tell us about your job because head ranger sounds terribly important. Yeah, and so I mean, I think firstly, I feel incredibly privileged to be the head ranger for Kruger. Um, so the head ranger is basically responsible for all ranger services. So Kruger is made up of four regions, which have a regional ranger, 22 sections, and then about 400 rangers that all report to me. Um, so an incredible responsibility, one that I definitely don't take lightly. Um, we all know Kruger's two million hectares, so very complex. The problems are very different though, from north to south of the park. Um, but at the same time, the challenges are actually really exciting. One of the key challenges is conserving the environment which you run rule over. In terms of the poaching and looking after the wildlife we have here in the Kruger, where do things stand at the moment? So yeah, I mean, I think for people to understand the poaching, um, a lot of focus is obviously on rhino, and that's where we're getting a lot of pressure, but we also have a lot of pressure in other sort of areas of poaching. So snaring, poisoning of carcasses, um, specifically poisoning of carcasses to attract predators which feed into the tr traditional medicine market is a problem so the the problems are quite diverse but obviously a lot of our energy and our focus is going into rhino poaching um, and we really determined to try and stem the tide in poaching we're very realistic that we probably will not be able to stop poaching altogether but we just want to halt it to a point where we have an increasing rhino population in Kruger which leads us to the dehorning process, which I got to be part of. Why have you chosen this process and why is it the best of what seemed like a, a limited selection of alternatives? Yeah, so I think people really need to understand that dehorning is just one of the tools in our toolbox. Certainly dehorning Rhino and dropping all our other sort of um, responses like security and access control, um, dewarning wouldn't work. So it's just a combination of things, but dewarning is a big part of it. Um, so we've decided in Kruger to strategically dewarn. Obviously we cannot because the numbers are still quite high. Dewarn every single rhino. So we've looked um, according to our census that we fly, where are the, the biggest um, numbers of our rhino? Where do we have the highest poaching pressure? And we've taken that and developed core areas. And within those core areas, we are dewarning all the rhino that we can and trying to maintain that dewarning. Um, and we're doing that to be able to protect those cores so we can protect our breeding cows specifically um, so the numbers increase within those cores. But also it's part of a strategy to tie and push people into poaching into areas where we can actually be more effective and we can catch them. Um, so it's been a difficult decision um, because once you dewarn, it's also not something that you do once off and that's it. You know, a rhino wound grows and it grows about 10 centimeters a year, which is still quite lucrative. So once we, we went down this path, we realized it was a commitment. Um, it's certainly not something we want to keep doing forever, but at the moment we're finding that it is effective in protecting our rhino and our cause and we can then focus the little resources we have into other areas. I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this question, but I'll ask it anyway. Are you optimistic about the future of the Kruger and its wildlife? Yeah, so I mean, many people ask me that, and I think none of us would have been out there today as we were if we didn't think there was hope. I mean, I think hope is certainly what keeps us going. And we've seen innovative things like the dewarning work. Um, we've seen things like the ISR, the night operations that the legacy has played a massive role in making a big difference. Um, so definitely we are hopeful. I mean, we certainly wouldn't be doing everything we were doing if we felt that there wasn't hope. Um, and certainly we have an opportunity to turn that around, but the opportunity is now. And we've got to do what we need to do right now. And I don't